So we spoke about bias and variance and we saw that simple models have a high bias but low variance and complex models have a low bias, high variance and so on and we saw it to some illustrative examples that what that is, what that means. And then the important thing to note was these two formal definitions of bias and the formal definition of variance which you all know anyways. And uh, then we, the important concept that we spoke about was the strain error versus test error, right. So this was the curve that we were interested in and one co co corner of this curve was related to high bias, low variance, the other corner was related to low bias, high variance, right. So, uh, and we were looking for something in the middle, okay. That is what our quest is in this lecture, right. We want to find ways of falling somewhere in middle, okay. And uh, uh, this, this led to the definition of two quantities of interest, uh, training error and test error. So, training error is computed from the training points. These are the points that you actually look at while you are solving this optimization problem, right. So, the training always involves solving an optimization problem which is the objective that you want to optimize or maximize. And the test error is something that you want to use it for at the eventually, right. So, you want to have these two quantities of interest that we design. And we realize that the train error is more optimistic whether the test errors actually gives us the real picture of what we do. And we tied this back to things that we have done previously in the machine learning or other courses that we always split the data into training, valid and test, train it on the training data, do some validations on the validation data, but never look at the test data. That is for the final evaluation, right. So, that is the, this is, this intuition which I have been trying to build with these two curves is the explanation for why we do things that way. And now we were interested in doing a more uh, mathematical, mathematically rigorous analysis of this intuition, right. So that is where we left off. So what we are uh, interested in or so now I will just start from this point is that we are given some data which is m and m training points and n testing points. And we know that there is a true function between the outputs and the inputs and we are also expecting or accepting some noise in this relation uh, just as in any other relation. So, which means that y is related to x i, but some by some true function, but there is also this noise. And for simplicity, simplicity we assume that this noise, noise comes from a normal distribution with 0 mean and some small variance. And as usual we never know f, right. Uh, but we are trying to approximate this f hat and we come up with some parametric form for f hat and then try to learn the parameters of f hat from the training subset of the data that is given to us, right. So, this is what we always do and we have already seen different variations of f hat, one of them being the deep neural network. Uh, and what we are actually interested in is this quantity. The expected difference or square difference between the predictions made by our model and the true value of the output with respect to the true function. Right. And then we asked, I asked you whether we can actually estimate this quantity and all of you said no. Why? Because we do not know what f of x i is, right. Uh, so, we will see how to estimate this empirically. So, then we started off with this uh, information that we have. We know what y i hat is because that is the prediction that we make and we know y i, what y i is. We do not know the function but we see the output of the function in the form of the training data points given to us or any data points given to us. So, we wrote this uh, by making this particular substitution where we notice that the y i that we see is actually the true function plus some noise and then we did some trickery and tried to uh, simplify this. And then we just realized that this is the term that we are interested in. So, we moved it to the other side of the equation and came up with this neat left hand side or uh, neat right hand side that we need to analyze now. So, so far everything is clear. This is where we ended the last class, right. I just went through it very quickly, but I assume everything is clear at this point, okay, fine. Uh, so, we are left with a bunch of expectations, right, and we have, I am assuming we have no clue how to estimate this, right. I mean, so, and remember that when you are dealing with expectations, there is always this true expectation and then this this empirical estimation. So, what we are going to move towards, so this all equations when I write E here, capital E here, I am talking about the true expectation 
and now we will see how to approximate the true expectation with an empirical expectation right and then based on that we will make some observations right. So, that is what we will do now. So, we will just take a small detour I will just tell you what expectations are or what empirically expectations how to compute them and so on right. So, suppose we have observed the goals scored in k matches there is some k football matches that we have seen and we have seen that the goals scored were the following right. Now, if I asked Q what is the expected value of the goal or the number of goals scored what will you do take the average of this this is what you will do. So, what is it that you are doing here you are taking a dash estimate of the expectation empirical estimate right. So, you are making some observations these are the observations yeah. given to you these are the k matches go as watch as many football matches as you want after the semester ends and then notice the number of goals that were scored in them and then you can compute this expectation right and this is how you do empirically. So, this is something that we do on a regular basis, but I just want you to realize that what you are doing is actually an empirical estimate of the true expectation is that fine ok. Now, can you relate this to the quantity that we are interested in we are interested in computing a certain expectation which is this. Can you take an analogy and tell me how you would do this? The hint is we have done this a million times in the course already fine. So, this is how we will do it and we have actually done this a million times in the course right. So, when we compute this we are actually doing an empirical estimate of the data. So, let us just take a minute to understand this we are given some data we are interested in this true expectation which we cannot compute. So, we will take this data we will assume there is enough of this we are given m samples which are enough and from that we will make an empirical estimate. And just as in the case of uh, these goals scored right as you see more and more matches you will have a better understanding of how many goals can be scored when a couple of when two particular teams are playing right the same analogy holds here as you see more and more data your estimate would become better, but that is how you will do the estimation ok. So, now we will come back to uh, so now do not get surprised when I am going to replace all these E's by this all the E's that we had in our original uh, equation. I am going to replace them by these summations ok fine. So, this was our original equation that we had derived and we were interested in this left hand side quantity which is a sum of some terms on the right hand side. So, now this expectations I told you that we can estimate it from data, but which data training data or test data both. So, we will try to estimate it from both and see if there is any difference which arises when you estimate it from one data and the other data ok. So, the first thing that I am going to do is I am going to use test observations to estimate this ok. So, can you tell me what are my summations going to look like summation over n plus 1 to n plus m right. We assume that the first n points are training points and the remaining points are test points. So, the quantity on the left hand side is true error remember that because that has f x which we do not know. Quantity on the right side the first thing is empirical estimation of the error ok. The second thing is a small constant I got the epsilon i square and we assume that it comes from a normal distribution with a small variance. What is the third quantity actually I have given you the answer already, but I want you to think about it. I am saying it is the covariance between two things ok. So, when I say it is the covariance between two things what is the first thing that I need to prove that the two things are dash random variables I mean first thing we need to see is that the two things are random variables epsilon i is clear it is a random variable right. What about this other thing or other epsilon is a random variable what about the other thing and depending on the training instance that you have sampled this going difference is going to differ right you are having your training or test instance whatever is this x i this is going to differ because these x's are different they are all random variables. So, this difference between these two quantities is also going to be a random variable is that fine ok. But still is this the so then I have told you this is x and this is y and what I am saying is that the covariance between x and y is just e of x x into y is that correct is that how you define covariance what is the definition of covariance if you have bothered to look at the prerequisites no no expectation in the form of e. So, covariance is e of x minus mu of x into y minus mu of y what is our x epsilon and what is our y ok what is mu of x 0. So, I will just simplify this a bit ok. I will open up the product ok. What is mu of uh, y into e of x ok. What is e of x what is the expected value of the noise 0 right. So, then this turns out to be as bad is that fine. 
that is why we are writing the covariance as just the product of the two things. Is it okay? Fine? Okay. So, now, so let us just take a minute to again understand this. The true error is the empirical estimation of the error plus, I mean plus or minus a small constant, okay. And then this nasty quantity that we do not know what to do with, right. So, let us look at this quantity and see what we can say about it, okay. Now, what is the covariance between these two? I am trying to compute this expectation from the test data, okay. Just remember that. So, each i here is a test instance. Are these two random variables dependent or independent is the question that I am trying to ask. Independent, why? So, let us look at it piecewise, right. So, remember that we had said that y i is equal to f of x i plus epsilon i, right. This epsilon i had no relation to f of x i. I mean I could choose any x i, but this noise is going to be random. So, there is no relation between these two. Now, is there a relation between f hat of x i and epsilon i? We are doing test. So, how did we come up with f hat of x i? How did, when I say how did we come up with f hat is I mean how did we learn the parameters of f hat? Using the training data and what are we computing the expectation with respect to now? Test, test data. These did, did these epsilons improve, uh, influence the parameters that we had learned for the, from the training data? No. So, hence there is no dependence between these two guys. So, that is why epsilon i is independent of the other random variable that you see in this expectation. Is that clear? Is this, do you get the intuition? F hat x i for the, no, but this is the, I mean this noise is what is present in the test data. And you have not seen this at training time, right. When you are training the parameters, you did not look at this noise. You are looking at the noise in the training data. So, this has not participated in the estimation of the parameters of f hat. But yeah, that was for the training data, right. But this now I am doing the expectation from the test data, right. So, these two random variables are independent. That means, I can write this as, is this fine? What will happen to this? Okay. So, what does, what did we eventually conclude? That the true error is equal to empirical test error plus a small constant, right. So, what does this tell you? Now, tell me, forget the math, tell me in English, right. What does this tell you? What does this mean? Can you relate it to now why you do this training error, validation error, test error? So, what does this tell me? This tells me that if I have trained a model and now if I take an estimate of the error on some data which I had not used for the training then that error which I see is actually very close to the true error. It only differs by this small constant. How many of you get that? That is why when I look at the validation error, it is not being overly optimistic. It is giving me a true picture of what the actual error is, right. So, there are two things that you need to understand here. One, this is the quantity that we are interested in which we cannot estimate. We are trying to estimate it by using this, we are trying to make an approximation. So, we are trying to see how good this approximation is. What this derivation is telling us is that if you are approximated it using the test error or the test data, then this approximation is actually very close to the true error. And how close it is actually? It just differs by this small constant. So, you get the importance of what we are seeing here, right. Okay. Now, to truly appreciate this, I need to tell you what would have happened if we had used the training data for this estimation, right. It is largely dependent, right. Yeah, but that is again a normal assumption that you make, right. So, this is okay, good that you asked at this point. So, I will be doing a couple of things today where we will be deriving some things, we will try to prove some things uh, mathematically, but all of these would have underlying some assumptions, okay. So, if you remember the Adam uh, uh, derivation with this, we did. There also we had made this funny assumption that the gradients are actually coming from a stationary distribution, which will not happen in practice, right. So, this reminds me of this joke from Big Bang Theory which says that I have a solution, but it only works for squared eggs in a vacuum, right. So, it is basically all these things always have some assumptions underlying them, but the idea is to kind of ignore those assumptions and see what happens in a neat setting and at least see whether in a neat setting everything works fine or not, right. So, that is what is happening here. So, it is a valid point that you are assuming that the noise comes from a, a zero mean distribution. Now, if the noise did not come from a zero mean distribution, then this would have not gone down to zero. 
and the mean would have been high then this is no longer a small constant and so on right. So, those things are there. So, this is going to happen in some of the other derivations that I do today. Uh, it is not that I am teaching you something wrong, it is just that you have to take it with a pinch of salt in the sense that these assumptions are there on the original derivations, these are not my assumptions and they work only under those assumptions right. So, you have to be careful about that. But the idea is that still with these assumptions can we at least make something meaningful out of it right. Is that fine with everyone? Can we all work with that basic premise ok fine. So, what I have done so far is told you that if you are estimating the error from the validation data you are doing a good job. Now, let us see if I had estimated the error from the training data. Take a guess what would happen? What would my argument for this be now? Now, this will not disappear right because these two are not independent now. I cannot write it as a product of two expectations that means, it will not go down to 0 ok fine. So, that is the argument which I am going to make. So, hence actually the true error if you see right it is equal to the empirical estimation plus some quantity. That means, the true error is dash as compared to the empirical error. That means, the empirical error that we see is pessimistic or optimistic? Optimistic right? that is what I started with that you give a very optimistic estimation of your error. If you are looking at this empirical estimation from the training data because you have ignored this quantity is it fine? So, what is missing in the story ok let us see now. What was this quantity so far in our all our discussions? L theta right, but now suddenly I have realized that my true error is actually L theta plus something else right. You see where I am headed with this ok. So, that is what we need to see now ok. Uh, now, I think it would be yeah we should, but I am pretty sure it is positive I, I cannot work it out right now, but I am pretty sure it is positive and right? you can see and if, if you find it is not then let me know ok. Uh, so, how is all this related to model complexity? We started off with this uh, idea that model complexity tells you how much is the bias, how much is the variance and because of that you get these two curves that you are not happy with one curve being very optimistic, the other curve being a bit pessimistic. Now, how does this discussion tie up to model complexity? 